Hello, good morning and good afternoon to everybody who's joining us for this webinar, which is a presentation of a recently published Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime report, Peace and Proliferation, Arms Control and Trafficking from the Conflict in Ukraine. My name is Tuesday Ray Tano. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Initiative, and I'm extremely pleased to be your moderator over the course of this event. We have three fantastic panelists joining us for our discussion. We have the report's two co-authors, Mark Galliotti and Anna Arrington, who are together, have done the research and are between them long-standing uh, analysts, researchers and policy advisors on Russia and the wider region. We have been extremely privileged to have Mark Galliotti as a member of our network for a number of years and to have Anna having joined us recently. They have also co-published a report that was published last year looking at the criminal ecosystem in the Donbass region. So uh, Mark and Anna, you're most welcome. We also have with us our field coordinator, Fedir or Fred Zorodoruk, who is based in Kiev. He has been leading our work in Ukraine for nearly a year now since the conflict broke out. The GI has been taking within its context the understanding that this catalytic and tragic event, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, and the responding effects and implications as the criminal economy and the legitimate economy have reshaped themselves around this new reality. One of the foundations for us in choosing to focus on the Ukraine in this way was the understanding that prior to the invasion, there was already a very enmeshed and very um, serious criminal ecosystem that was in place in the region. As of the findings of our 2021 Global Organized Crime Index, Russia was the country in Europe with the highest criminality score, and Ukraine was the third. What this invasion has done, we have found over the course of a years of monitoring, has been to rupture this ecosystem, sending shockwaves and reverberations across the global illicit economy that can be felt in our work in Africa, in Latin America and elsewhere. So we have been publishing a series of reports. I'm sure you've all seen them. First of all, a one year in retrospective that looked at the way the criminal economy changed as a, uh, in the year following the invasion. Mark's report, uh, Mark and Anna's report on arms control, a review of the vulnerabilities and risks for human trafficking. And we have a number of more reports forthcoming in the coming months, looking at issues around corruption, around drug trafficking, and a political economy study of Odessa and its port. All of these we look forward to sharing with you um, in the weeks to come, but I will not take any more time from our presenters um, before I turn the floor to them. We will be welcoming questions at the end of this webinar after all three speakers have spoken. So please, if you do have those questions, we'd invite you to put them into the chat as the um, discussion on goes. That will give us a chance to review them, sort them, organize them, and feed them to the panelists in a way that they can best respond. So please comment into the chat. Any other concerns, you can send them either directly to me as the moderator or to our facilitator or um, into the public forum. Um, but we look forward to beginning a dialogue with you all afterwards. So with no further ado, Anna, I believe you're going first. Can I pass the floor to you, please? Well, actually, I'll, I'll be speaking first. If I can just very briefly sort of preface um, the situation. Hi there. Delighted to, to be with you all out there in, in, in virtual land. Just wanted to kind of give a very brief introduction to, to, to this particular project. Obviously, it's looking at the issue of proliferation of, of weapons, because this is something that obviously almost any conflict has a tendency to, to, to create. We come at it from, to a degree, the, 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 initially the, the, the Russia side of things, but particularly in, in Anna's case as a Moscow-based journalist and then the senior analyst, Russia analyst for International Crisis Group, she spent a lot of time traveling across the, the Donbass on, shall I say, both sides of the undeclared war's front line. Um, Anna had had to obviously leave Russia at, at speed after the events of February of last year. 
Whereas I have you know, for a long time been working on Russian politics and security issues, but also had a subsidiary uh, interest in Ukrainian issues, but in particular had worked on transnational criminality and the degree to which there was a close integration between Russian and Ukrainian gangs. So that, that, that gives you a, a social sense of where we come from. This report is based in part on open sources, also from official sources, conversations with a variety of interlocutors, and also on some decidedly unofficial sources, including people on the wrong side of the, the legal boundaries. And clearly what we've had to do is because this is a, a very complex and difficult subject to study, triangulate between as many of these sources as possible. I'd also add that we look at both sides of the front line. And although it's a lot harder to get a sense of what's happening on, in the Russian occupied territories, nonetheless, it is absolutely crucial, not least because if the war ends with Ukraine having accomplished its stated objectives of bringing all the occupied territories back under its control, the mess that, is, that has been and is being created on the Russian side of the front lines will become a toxic inheritance for Kyiv. And clearly what happens to Ukraine will also end up becoming a challenge, a problem for Europe and, and the West as a whole. So we do have to sort of look at both sides of, of the front line, however difficult. Anyway, what, what's going to happen now is Anna is going to talk particularly about the, the rise of the problem and, and the key reasons why this is a challenge that we need to be looking at now. And then I will pick up to talk a bit about some of the possible solutions that are outlined in our report. So Anna, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's really great to uh, speak with uh, Gitak again. Uh, great to be here. So I'll start with uh, some of the main highlights from um, from our, our report, what I think is uh, most important here. Um, before Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine last February, I traveled there pretty regularly and had the opportunity to observe uh, the start of the conflict nearly 10 years ago in Crimea um, and Donbass. And whether I was talking to activists, militants, lawmakers, or think tankers on both sides of the conflict, uh, I really saw two very serious problems that kind of feed into um, other issues uh, in, in, in terms of weapons proliferation. Um, the first thing that struck me was just how easy it seemed to get weapons, whether it was on uh, the Maidan in Odessa or in Donetsk, and I'm, I'm talking very early on. Um, the pro-Maidan activists uh, in 2014 admitted the support they had from government connections, including providing them with what weapons they needed. Um, the Russian and pro-Russian rebels in the East complained incessantly about poor quality of the weapons they had to rely on and how Russia wasn't giving them enough. Um, but the interesting thing is in the process, they divulged just how much they were lifting literally off the streets and how easy it was to get. Um, I'll never forget the uh, look of a boy, probably around 18, uh, 19, who uh, popped out of the top of an armored personnel carrier. He had driven into the uh, central square of Donetsk in May 2014. And um, when I asked him where he got it, he uh, beamed and bragged about how just picking it up from the depot, uh, from a depot outside of town. Uh, another pro-Russian Ukrainian rebel fighter described uh, in the beginning of the conflict how they would buy BMPs and manpads from Ukrainian forces. Um, they would just bring them to us. Uh, they would just bring us rocket launchers in Zhigulis, uh, he told me at the time. Um, the second problem was the role and agency of non-state actors on both sides of the conflict and the difficulties that each government had in reining them in and making them act in accordance with national and government interests. Um, this is a pretty serious issue. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about it. It's a very divisive issue, not least because in their own way, neither official Kiev nor official Moscow, especially Moscow, for all of its propaganda in the beginning about uh, how it was all just volunteers, would really want to admit uh, that this was the case. 
doing so for them would mean exposing uh, a great deal of weakness and corruption. Uh, in a way, I, I, I always believe that Russia's decision to launch a full-scale invasion was uh, in part a consequence of the Kremlin's unwillingness or inability to put a stop to the mercenaries, grifters, and fanatics, whether rogue state agents or non-state actors or both, that it relied on uh, as auxiliaries, but that in some ways ended up actually suborning Kremlin policies in the end. But this is this has been a problem in Ukraine too, uh, in different ways. And I want to stop on this issue in particular because currently, uh, while Ukraine is united ar around fighting against Russian aggression, the militias have been reined in and are essentially all part of the armed forces. They're no longer non-state actors on the Ukrainian side. Uh, they are fully integrated within Ukrainian command and control, and there are a few political divisions given the enormity of the threat and the task that lies before them. So we're not seeing so much weapons proliferation right now while all these weapons and groups are engaged in fighting, fighting off the Russians. But that doesn't mean that the situation will continue, that this, this will be the case once the fighting stops. Um, before the full-scale invasion, and particularly in 2014 to 2016, and in my experience as late as 2019, there were considerable difficulties in getting some of the volunteer militias to give up their weapons or comply with government orders. Um, in some cases, legislation and policy was molded to accommodate these groups rather than actually disarm them. Uh, that is a situation that is highly likely to return once the fighting stops, but it's also not inevitable. Um, I want to stress this here, that Ukrainians have shown remarkable feats of cohesion and with the right policies, particularly a solid demobilization, disarmament and reintegration strategy, these past issues can be avoided. Um, but it, this is going to be particularly difficult and important, uh, not so much when it comes to pro-Ukrainian volunteer militias, but the pro-Russian ones. Uh, in other words, the Ukrainian citizens, tens of thousands of them, fighting for the Russian side in Russian-occupied territories. That will pose the larger risk. So um, these two problems, lack of state control over armed groups and the ease of obtaining weapons predated Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And once the fighting stops, I feel that these problems will return. And so together, they're a recipe for global arms pro proliferation. I encourage you to read the report in full, but I want to summarize some of our key findings before getting to the recommendations of what can be done. So first of all, Lax gun laws make it difficult to control weapons in the first place. Um, according to some figures, at the end of 2017, there were 11 million state and civilian owned firearms, including 5 million unregistered firearms. Taken together with the fact that this, uh, there is no legal statute regulating gun ownership, only interior ministry instructions stipulating how gun permits are issued, it's clear how hard it's been to keep track of all these guns and control who gets them. This was a problem that predated the start of the conflict in Donbass, but it was also exacerbated by it. And while keeping track of weapons in government and civilian hands was hard enough in Ukraine, it became virtually impossible in Russian-occupied areas in Donbass. Um, secondly, prior to the conflict, Ukrainian law enforcement engaged in a widespread practice of gifting weapons and licenses to favored politicians, service personnel, or businessmen. Between 2004 and 2016, the Interior Ministry alone issued 2,230 guns. Practices made it difficult to differentiate between legal and illegal firearms and to monitor illegal flows. And third, um, starting in 2014, this practice was exacerbated by the need to mobilize the population against Russian aggression. The Russian threat made it easy for any group to obtain weapons, and indeed the government encouraged pro-Maidan militias to take what they needed. But the more the interim government handed out weapons, the more they struggled to get the militias to surrender them. One way they got around this was simply enlisting the volunteer militias who wanted to hold guns, who wanted to hold on to their guns. And fourth, um, on the day of the invasion, President Zelensky ordered his government to provide weapons to anyone who wanted to defend the country. Only an ID card was required. In the first two days alone, over 25,000 automatic rifles, 10 million rounds of ammunition, and unknown numbers of rocket-propelled grenade launchers were handed out to civilians. And furthermore, civilians resorted to stockpiling weapons before the invasion and especially after. 
That is to say nothing of the battlefield. Weapons are picked up from fallen enemies, exchanged informally between units, again, taken home and buried in some cases. Um, and all of this uh, further stands in the way of proper accounting. And finally, as the need for Ukrainian defense grew with Russia's full-scale invasion, so did the supply. Um, NATO countries, particularly the United States, supplied unprecedented quantities of lethal weapons. While most were heavier weapons that were carefully counted, some would inevitably wind up in the hands of some of the thousands of American volunteers that signed up to fight for Ukraine. But particularly problematic were the less official sources of weapons. Um, private suppliers and crowdfunding campaigns proliferated, and with them the difficulties and oversight of the weapons and who ultimately got them. Vetting had become next to non-existent in the fog of war. Currently, the hot phase of the war has had two effects on weapons proliferation. The first is that unified and galvanized the non-state groups, making it easier for the government to incorporate them entirely into the army's chain of command. The second is that the war has disrupted traditional trafficking routes, making it impossible to move weapons, or very difficult at the least. Since the weapons are pretty much all in use for defense, there's, no, there's really very little incentive to sell them. And as a result, there's currently no substantial outflow of weapons from the Ukrainian conflict zone. Um, but our findings point to a number of risks uh, once the fighting stops, and this is really what we have to prepare for. First is the resumption of trade. Um, Weapons trafficking was robust prior to the invasion. There is no reason to believe that once the hot phase ceases to disrupt illegal trade, that it will not resume. And I would just want to add here that uh, the Russian threat has created a certain civilian demand for defense and weapons. Uh, and uh, other reports have looked at this as well, um, that uh, there is a need. There are, there are potential buyers out there. And where there are buyers, they may, they, there may well be sellers. Um, secondly, insurgencies. Uh, this is a twofold problem. The first is that if Kiev were to retake territories occupied by Russia for nearly a decade, will it be able to win over the militias that have operated there? Prior to the invasion, that was as many as 40,000 mainly Ukrainian citizens making up the militias of the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Likewise, uh, once Ukrainian defense has less need for the volunteer militias that it has incorporated into their ranks, will they lay down their arms or will they find old mistrust of the government reemerge and new reasons to hold on to their guns? And third, an uptick in crime and instability. Um, guns are already playing a greater role in crime in both Ukraine and Russia, particularly in regions close to the Ukrainian border. Offenses with uh, firearms in Ukraine rose tenfold in 2022, and in Russia, the increase was also considerable, though not as dramatic. Um, but when there are more loose arms on the market, this is likely to become more of a problem as people start bringing the weapons home with them. So with that, I'd like to give the floor uh, back over to Mark, uh, who is uh, the man with a plan, and we'll talk some more about recommendations. Um, thank you very, very much. Well, thanks very much, Anna. Yeah, exactly. This is a situation that, that we all find ourselves in. At the moment, there is no evidence of any major sustained flow of weapons outside of Ukraine. If anything, the opposite is true. There is a continued flow inwards as people look for particular weapons either to meet needs or often specialist varieties or even ones that are just regarded as more fashionable or more cool. There is a kind of military chic at work there. However, the preconditions for an outflow when the guns fall silent are all there. There is, a, and this is a very soft figure, so treat it with caution, an estimated 7 million illegal or unregistered firearms. And also, as well as all these various man portable weapons, there are also the heavier ones. No one's likely to be buying a tank because it's not just about the tank, it's about the skills to be able to use it, the maintenance, the spare parts, etc. But on the other hand, we talk, if we're talking about shoulder-fired anti-aircraft or anti-tank weapons, it is clear that a certain number of them, not huge numbers, but enough, have already been diverted. There will be large numbers of demobilized fighters, angry, scarred, and returning to a country which is probably in the throes of a very, very difficult reconstruction possibly with the options of actually leaving the country when border controls are, are lifted. 
again, these are the people who have the guns, who know the guns, who may well find that they actually don't really have the current skill set to easily and quickly adapt back to civilian life, will probably not be presented with a huge range of options for reintegration by a state which probably doesn't have the resources to do so. And weapons are going to be in part their little sort of trove that they can actually sell, something they can monetize just to make some money, but it also may well be sort of a trade that they understand. There are extensive organized crime networks. Before the war, frankly, Ukrainian and Russian organized crime networks were very, very heavily integrated. That's been broken, and I think it'll be difficult to reintegrate them on any, at any speed or any large scale. But what this means is that by having this uh, criminal ecosystem sundered in two, is that the Ukrainians who once looked east are now looking west. They're looking, and, and indeed south, looking to create new markets and new connections. Weapons will be one of the commodities at their disposal. Corruption is going to be a serious problem, as it has been and as it still is today. It's a difficult one to talk about. It's, it's one that, you know, for obvious reasons, people would rather not talk about. But nonetheless, I think we have to. And the Global Initiative, this is something that's on their radar, and there are going to be future reports that understand on that. And finally, that there is demand at home, and there will be. But in particular, there is definitely demand abroad. One of the other projects underway with the Global Initiative under Jérôme Verre is to actually look at black market as well as licit prices for weapons, not just in Ukraine, but in neighboring European countries, to use that as a kind of early warning system. And one of the things that's already emerged is not just that there aren't many weapons flowing out, but for example, in countries such as Poland, there is quite a substantial unmet desire for these, these weapons. So all of this suggests that when the war ends, as we've seen in so many other wars, not least the Balkans, that that is when we will face a problem. But this is not a council of despair. Things are being done to address this, but more to the point, we do have the time, if we move in a purposeful and proactive way now, to actually get ahead of the problem and maybe, just maybe, learn some of the lessons from past policy blunders. So what, what can be done? Look, the report has a whole menu of options, and I don't propose to go through all of them. If you're interested, I'd absolutely encourage you to read the report, which can be downloaded from the Global Initiative website for free. So instead, let's, let's take a look, I mean, firstly, at some of the things that are being done, and then what both Ukraine and Ukraine's partners can do. I mean, at the moment, you know, there have been a series of controls which have been established, showing that, in fact, Ukraine is aware of the challenge, but also that its international partners are pushing for moves to be done. Uh, last summer, the Ukrainian parliament set up a temporary special commission to monitor and dispose of weapons. Disposal, after all, is often a crucial issue. It's not just about weapons in use, it's the ones that are lost or destroyed, which then crop up in, in other hands. Since 2022, we've had inspectors general from the US State and Defense Departments and indeed USAID who are active. And from, <clears throat> excuse me, from February, they have actually been working on the ground in Ukraine. The thing is though, this is largely about large scale equipment. This is about the tanks and the artillery pieces rather more than a rifle here and a sniper weapon there. Those are the weapons which are actually much more easily stolen, the, the smaller ones, much more easily sold, much more easily trafficked. And the monitoring that's been taking place on that is, let's be perfectly honest, patchy, limited, often frankly inaccurate, and largely coming in too late. So some systemic strategic choices are needed. Let's look at what Ukraine can be doing, first of all. First step, and this is a relatively straightforward one, is, is indeed legal report, reform. I mean, as Anna has said, there's a strange anomaly that actually gun control law is embodied in administrative rather than statutory form. It's about how the Interior Ministry applies these various rules. And we've seen in the past that what this tends to mean is not only that it's very, very uh, subject to corruption and favoritism, but also that it's applied in different ways across different regions of the country. So actually, you know, a, a, a proper centralized gun law is important. 
And it's, it's the kind of thing that can be done. I mean, one of the challenges often is that, understandably, people in Ukraine will say, we are fighting an existential war for the survival and sovereignty of our state. And everything else has to take second place. We cannot divert resources. Well, with the greatest respect to the parliamentarians and their legal drafting specialists, those who are not actually holding a rifle on the front line, well, this is actually a useful thing they can be doing for the safety and sovereignty of, of, of Ukraine themselves. Beyond that, I think also addressing issues such as the uh, distribution of, of, of weapons as, as gifts, particularly when, when we recently had a case of a Western police chief who, who blew up his own office with a grenade launcher that he had been presented. This maybe is, is a tradition that should be disposed to, to, to the, the, the dustbin of history. Secondly, accounting and inventory. It's one of the most tedious issues to talk about. It's not at all exciting. It is also phenomenally important. This question of the need to try and retros retrospectively, in many cases, address the question of how you track the weapons that are, are doing the rounds. As I said, so many of them have, have been distributed without any kind of record. If one looks, for example, at those which were distributed at the beginning of the war, in some cases, the names and details of the people who were issued weapons were, were, were logged, in some cases not. But very rarely was, was it you know, some, anything like, say, the, the serial number of, of, of a weapon that was handed out in any way sort of registered. So it, it is going to be, be difficult, but there will be the need to firstly create some kind of, of centralized and, and digitized system to control further distributions of weapons. And secondly, to try and ensure that at least at the point of transfer, when, when, when people are selling or moving weapons, that that can be registered. Again, this is not an exciting thing, but it is a really important one. It will always, unfortunately, be very patchy. But what the purpose of these kind of measures is often about, it's to begin to sift legitimately held but unregistered weapons from entirely illegal ones. Bit by bit, you're actually trying to reduce the pool of those which are illegally held or at least to be able to identify and prove that when you come across a weapon stockpile, that's what it is. And that links to the third particular area of potential reform, which is amnesties and buyback schemes. Now, this is unlikely to happen until obviously hostilities are over and it will run into not only an established gun culture within Ukraine generally, but also an, a wholly understandable sense among Ukrainians that they will continue to need to be ready to defend their homeland against a potential future threat. So a lot of people will just actually bristle at the notion that they should hand over their weapons. But nonetheless, again, where possible, measures should be taken to try and make that both worthwhile, but also in a way lucrative. Now, buyback schemes carry all sorts of risks. They are very, very uh, you know, easily abused. They're quite difficult to run. They, they run the risk of actually creating a whole new market where maybe none existed before. But if conducted properly, again, what they do is they give people a reason, people who might just simply have picked up a weapon because they thought it might be necessary or because they just came across it um, from a former battlefield or whatever and thought, well, I might as well have it. The sort of person who was not necessarily thinking of trading it to potential insurgents, terrorists, or gangsters with all the risks involved. And therefore, if the state offers them a no questions asked easy way to turn it into a little bit of money, they'll be perfectly happy to do so, rather than actually hold out for the more money, but much, much greater risk. Because the key reason is this, we already know that there is stockpiling taking place. And I'm not just talking about someone who perhaps has a few Kalashnikovs buried in his back garden or, or, or kept in his uh, root basement. No, I'm talking about organized crime groups who precisely at present appreciate that it's actually quite difficult because of the you know, near martial law conditions and control over the borders and so forth to actually export illegal weapons in any particularly large numbers, but who anticipate that that day will come and are using the conflict as an opportunity precisely to assemble stockpiles of weapons that in due course, they will be able to move on to the illegal markets, which precisely could be to organize crime figures in Europe or beyond, or it could be insurgents, depending on the, on the scale and the nature of their contacts. Now, these are 
problematic for all kinds of reasons, but they also provide an opportunity because precisely the more that we sift out the, shall I say trivial, I hesitate to say harmless weapon stockpiling, the easier it is to begin to concentrate on the genuinely illegal. That of course will be done by, above all, law enforcement agencies. And so the, the fourth main area of reform that is needed is, and it's a very, very broad one, it is precisely measures to counter corruption and institute meaningful police reform. And when I say police, that also extends particularly to the SBU, the Ukrainian Security Service, which is in, in some ways a very under-reformed sector of, of, of the government structure. Now, this is not going to be easy. Firstly, it's a politically tense issue to raise in the first place. Secondly, I mean, actually the endemic corruption at every level of the state that we saw before the war has not gone away. It has changed form, it has changed its loci and so forth. We would all like to believe that Ukrainians are now in their uh, cohesive commitment to preserving their country, putting aside all this, this negative baggage of the past. Unfortunately, although for many that may well be true, it is not just a, a, a magical solution. The very real process of state building we are seeing happening, and indeed nation building in, in Ukraine does not magically wipe the slate clean. So there is deep corruption still today. It is shifting, it is finding its, its new forms, but it's not going away. And without very, very serious measures, it will not disappear in a post-war era. And this is the point, the, the best antidotes to illegal arms proliferation are rule of law and efficient and capable law enforcement. And that's not just a, a, an arms control issue. I mean, that actually applies to a whole variety of different potential problems that Ukraine will face in the post-war era. And finally, to touch on something that, that, that Anna has already sort of raised, Ukraine needs a proper disarmament, demobilization and reintegration strategy. And that involves a different kind of amnesty, one that's even harder to raise in the contemporary environment in Ukraine, again, for, for understandable reasons, which is also for certain of the people who are you know, working for the Russian occupation administrations, or indeed may well have been taking up arms in, in support of you know, anti-Kiev forces. It's gonna be very, very difficult. The point is, if you basically treat everyone who had a government salary or whatever in the occupied territories, which includes everyone from fighters to teachers, then actually what you do is you create alienated populations in territories which are already glutted with weapons and who have no reason at all to cooperate with the authorities and quite the opposite they may well actually if they're not going to use those weapons themselves actually have an incentive to to distribute them this is again one of these incredibly difficult areas of discussion and i think it, it is one that it's worth raising now because of that very difficulty that actually the more people can feel that they're integrated into the new Ukrainian nation, even if they were on the wrong side, shall we say, of, of the conflict, the more likely they are to be partners to the, to the state in actually dealing with the proliferation issue rather than actually its, its, its enemies. Now, this is a, a pretty formidable uh, you know, series of, of, of requirements really. And again, only anyone's pretending that it will be easy to address. I think it's important to start now. But fortunately for Ukraine, it also has considerable support from it, it partner countries, which obviously, you know, at the moment they're focusing on buoying up the uh, civilian economy and also providing military assistance for the conflict. But it does extend beyond that. There is an expectation that Ukraine, after all, will be integrated, whether it's as a member of NATO or the European Union, or just simply a partner thereof. But nonetheless, the expectation is this is a country which will be integrated within Western structures. And therefore, for the best of all reasons, enlightened self-interest, we also have a good reason to want to assist Ukraine in addressing challenges such as these. So let me just sort of conclude by talking about some of the various options available to Ukraine's uh, international partners. Now, again, there is a whole shopping list 
uh, of, of, of proposals in, in the report. I'm going to just simply sort of touch on the, the, the headers and dig into just a couple, which I think are, are worth a bit of exploration. One of them is obviously capacity building, supporting the ability of the Ukrainian state to do the things that it wants to do. And that ranges from, I mean, it's obviously there's, there's accounting, being able to, to sort of monitor all this stuff, law enforcement. I mean, a lot is already being done. There's the European Union Assistance Mission. There's uh, UNOPS Pravo, which is a, a law enforcement support mission. A lot of these clearly are to a degree in abeyance actually during the hot stage of the, of the war. But nonetheless, it, it does address the question of police reform. Very much so, it's actually about the operational level at the moment. And again, I think we, we, we need to reopen conversations about a wider structural one. You know, a certain amount of work has been done about the Ukrainian police, it's worth noting, and, and recognizing that. But there is more to be done, and I said there's even more to be done within the context of, of the SBU, which is crucial because part of the SBU's frankly rather bloated remit is as well as counterintelligence and so forth, it also has a key role in combating organized crime. Um, I was going to say a key role in organized crime, but maybe that would be a little bit too much on the nose given some of the allegations made about it. But anyway, so supporting meaningful reform of law enforcement. And that comes with it, and also the intelligence community. Issues, again, very technical issues like the safe disposal of weapons, how to ensure that they are genuinely disposed, that they cannot be reactivated, and that it's done without pollution or, or loss of life. Border security. Again, a lot of this is, is about just simply providing suitable numbers of, of scanning equipment and training and the like can be done. And intelligence sharing. I mean, this is actually an area where in, in some ways the, the war has led to a, a total revolution in the amount of intelligence, Western intelligence that is being shared with the Ukrainians, particularly on an operational level, about which Russian units are aware and such like, even targeting data. Well, now we should also be thinking about how in due course that will transition to civilian and on peacetime intelligence sharing, that can be much more about how to address and disrupt organized crime networks and the like. Cooperation and control on and beyond the border is the sort of second main heading. Again, it's, it's practical support about border control. It's about training assistance. There's a lot to be done there. And again, it's about intelligence sharing there, but very much focusing on the borders. I mean, there's a problem with that in that we don't want to make it seem as if we don't really care what happens in Ukraine, we just want to make sure it doesn't come over in, in, into other countries. But nonetheless, I mean, this is a, a piece of the overall issue. Thirdly, rule of law environment. I mean, this is, this is absolutely crucial. When it comes down to it, the best way of ensuring that Ukraine does not continue to be a turntable for all kinds of smuggled goods, including weapons, is precisely to, 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 to nurture an environment in which the police can do their work and they do so in partnership with the Ukrainian people. That requires a, you know, a, a serious move towards a sort of renovation of the relationship between state and society through the medium of the law. So yes, it means things like helping them draft gun control laws, but it also actually means political accountability. It does mean a certain kind of tough love. One of the mistakes that we've made so often in the past, and in different ways one can say this is dealing with Russia in the 1990s or Balkan states since, but also Iraq and Afghanistan, is to talk about the importance of political accountability and the need to only work with uncorrupt institutions, but then make all kinds of expedient shortcuts and turn a blind eye in the name of day-to-day -day stability and such like. We do have to recognize and, and, and speak honestly, as friends do, about deep-seated problems, issues like corruption, oligarchic control and the like, and maintain the degree of pressure to go with the, the support that, that we provide Ukraine on that. And very finally, brokering and assisting regional cooperation. This is not just about blocks and, and Ukraine, this is about a whole variety of countries, particularly the ones bordering Ukraine. And there are all still quite serious obstacles at the moment to proper cooperation. I remember in, in 2022, I was talking to a Romanian security officer who was involved in addressing issues of uh, cross-border criminality, who said that actually he now had really good working connections with his Ukrainian counterparts. And when it came to informal linkages, no problem, he could just pick up a phone 
and they could share information, share tip-offs, etc. As soon, though, as it had to go into the formal realms, it was suddenly tied up in so much red tape, so much political overwatch and so forth, that it became almost impossible. Well, these are the kind of practical obstacles that actually, if we can solve, they make everyone's life, everyone law-abiding's life, that much easier. So that's, as I said, a, a very quick canter through the kind of, of, of proposals. The key thing is this, I really have to re reiterate this. You know, at the moment, this is not a big problem for us because Ukraine is acting as a sponge. It is actually soaking up illegal weapons rather than shedding them. When the war ends, that sponge will be squeezed. And what will be, I mean, a, a glorious moment for Ukraine will actually become a problem for everyone near Ukraine. And this is why we do need this very purposeful and proactive approach now, rather than waiting for that problem to arise. Thank you. Mark and Anna, thank you so much for the comprehensive presentation, for the engagement, the intellect and the analysis, as well as the recommendations. I'd like to pass the floor to my colleague, Fedia, who is calling us in from Kiev this morning, afternoon in some cases, and uh, we'll, we'll make a response, I think, from the Ukrainian perspective and some of the credibility, speaking to some of the credibility around the Ukrainian capacity to enact a credible response. Fred, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, well, it's very hard to, to add something to this profound report and uh, the things we've heard now, but I will try. First of all, it has to do with the field work we're doing uh, as an organization here in Ukraine. Uh, number one, some of the things that Ukraine has done since the report uh, has been published, okay, there were some developments. Uh, development number one, the Ministry of the Interior said that we will have a unified register of all weapons uh, held, uh, you know, by people in Ukraine. So supposedly that's a step in the right direction. Uh, of course, Mark Mark told Mark said that you know there are dangers to that. I mean, how do you do that? Uh, what's the the mechanism? But it is a step in the right direction. Second of all, and I think this is uh, also up for discussion. There is more talk of legalizing weapons because, as you've mentioned already, Ukraine is very weird in this sense because the only thing that regulates uh, weapons in Ukraine is an order by the ministry of the interior and that's it so we have no laws of course those are needed but there is talk maybe because there are so many weapons in here maybe we should legalize them or do something about them so that's a topic for discussion uh also in the report states this it stresses this that there could be sort of uh different situations uh, in case ukraine wins and in case ukraine what we call doesn't win back all its territories okay that could lead to different kinds of developments if you take weapons in ukraine and then weapon smuggling in the future so uh say an insurgency here in ukraine if there's this peace agreement at this point and ukraine would lose parts of its territory could lead to you know those groups that you mentioned doing something with all the weapons they have that would lead to other stuff probably a lot more serious i would also like to talk about the dangers some of them were mentioned dangers like corruption and things like that uh, but i would also like to mention others so uh, right now uh, like mark said ukraine is a sponge a lot of weapons being brought in a lot of, of weapons being brought in illegally there are certain mechanisms and ways of doing that one of the mechanisms is using uh, volunteer groups to bring in illegal weapons. And if that mechanism is used to bring in weapons into Ukraine, I think when the war ends and things will change, that mechanism could be used to get the weapons out. All of the schemes are there, all of the routes are there, all the mechanisms are there. It's just a matter of turning you know, the flow around. Um, one of the other things that Mark mentioned and Anna is, uh, you know, international border cooperation. There will be the question, and I think this should be stressed, the question of the cooperating between the cooperation between the Ukrainian and Russian side. 
without such co cooperation, the flow of weapons is a lot easier for criminals to organize. Uh, so, of course, at this point, any cooperation between Ukrainian and Russian law enforcement is probably not probable. But in the future, this would, would be something that needs to be addressed and solved. Uh, we also talked about the anticipation of the day that comes. I wrote that down. Uh, the day that comes, so when the hostilities end. Uh, our field work is proving that, you know, it's not just the ordinary citizen that's waiting for that day to come. For instance, the all the criminal organizations are already waiting for that day to come and are already preparing. Our field work in certain regions, for instance, the regions in the south, which would be the ports mostly, uh, and that those were the main hubs for any kind of smuggling in Ukraine, of course, predominantly Odessa, but some of the other ports near Odessa, like Mykolaiv, um, the, the actors, they're already back. So they're just waiting for that day that comes to get the flows going again. Of course, they might look westward, they're not looking at eastward anymore. But if they do look westward, it means that they already have some ideas and some mechanisms in place. And since these actors are back or their facilitators are back, they're getting ready. So the danger is already there. Uh, the other danger is um, that we are not seeing any signs of the Ukrainian government thinking strategically and even tactically of what to do after the war ends with all of the weapons, with all of, of course, the danger is we're talking about is Western weapons, the, the Soviet made weapons, the old weapons, they're always on the market. They always have been. And if you look at, you know, dark net websites and stuff like that, you can always find Makarovs and Kalashnikovs for as low as $20 in the DNR. And you can buy it for $150 here you know, complete with everything you need. But uh, of course the Western style weapons or the Western made weapons uh, will be on the market. It's, it's just a matter of time. The Ukrainian government is not ready. The Ukrainian government is not proposing any sort of policy of what to do with that. So that of course needs to be addressed. Maybe some pressure applied on the Ukrainian government to do something about it now, not tomorrow, but now. Another, uh, Another thing, another danger I want to address, and it has to do with legalizing weapons. So just as an experiment, uh, I went to a Ukrainian arms store. Uh, we don't legal, we can't legally buy uh, automatics and semi-automatics, you know, firearms. Uh, but actually you can, and the they're called sports weapons. So you can buy Rugers, you can buy M4s, you can buy Turkish made uh, automatic rifles for as low as $300, $400 in any uh, weapon store. And you, you can legally buy it. So that's not a problem. The problem is buying a pistol because you need to be part of, uh, of law enforcement to do that. But if you want a semi-automatic rifle or an automatic rifle, just go ahead. What you need is just a permit. You need a safe in your house that's screwed to your floor or your wall. And uh, you need a paper from a psychiatrist saying that you're okay. And I said, uh, I asked the, the, you know, the, the, the seller, well, you know, how long does that take? Uh, she said, well, two months, but you can actually, and she told me this, you can actually bypass this by just buying all the papers you need, but it's just a hassle, you know, that's what she said. So I think that's also a danger that needs to be addressed. Because you can, you don't have to smuggle a semi-automatic into Ukraine if you can buy it for four hundred dollars, and it's not that bad. And everyone's saying, you know, there's a problem with Western-made ammo, NATO standard ammo. I asked the seller about it, and she said, "What problems are you talking about? You know, if, if you need it, if you need a box, if you need a, you know, a, I don't, as as much as you need, just go ahead and buy it." Um, another danger. Um, is of course uh, corruption and uh, in Ukraine corruption is everywhere as we all know it hasn't changed well it, it sort of has changed uh, but but not much I guess to a certain level certain degree uh, but what that leads to is of course mistrust from our western partners and during our field work right now what we're hearing is the mist there's all there's trust there 
course, because there's supplies of weapons coming in. But there's also mistrust at the level of uh, our Western partners, representatives going to storages and warehouses and actually checking from time to time if, you know, the supplies are still there, you know. And uh, when being asked, why do you ask, why do you do it? They say, well, you know, we've heard of a lot of corruption in Ukraine. So, you know, we decided not just tr just to trust the, the reports we get, trust the papers, but maybe have a look at it ourselves. So it's there. Um, another danger is, of course, uh, the restoration of the ecosystem, the criminal ecosystem uh, between Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, the latest data we have been getting is there are already um, places on the front line that are seeing illegal stuff going through. So people are saying that we remember 2014, the fighting 2015, there was the hot phase, what we call the hot phase, that everything calmed down and certain brigades, they kind of made an agreement with each other on one side and the other, that for instance, on a certain day uh, at 12 p.m. or at 1 a.m., there's a certain truck that goes through and one side and the other side lets it through. Of course, that has had to do with, with, uh, with mostly, say, you know, gold, coal, stuff like that. Now the danger is, of course, weapons. Because uh, Russia, although it declared that the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions and some other Ukrainian regions are part of its territory, it still has the border and the border guards on the borders, on, you know, on the division line with those territories. So Russia is actually checking everything that goes out of those territories. Of course, afraid, first of all, of the weapons flow and the drug flow. And then, as Anna mentioned, we see the uh, the tremendous increase of you know criminality in border region in bordering regions by 400, 450 percent, stuff like that. Uh, another thing uh, to mention, I think, uh, if you talk about corruption, is um, the military, and I think that is being overlooked because the military is a sort of a brotherhood, especially community, especially uh, in certain units. And uh, during our field work, we have been hearing of things like, you know, there's this uh, unit, uh, it's a mortar brigade, has several several mortar units. And uh, the commander of this unit, he is right now building a dacha, so a country house. And uh, when being asked how much does he make, uh, they say, well, you know, he makes a couple of thousand dollars a month and asked, well, where does he get the money? They say, well, first of all, he uses the soldiers that are supposed to serve on the front line. So, for instance, if you're an electrician and your commander finds out about it, he can take you to from the front line to relax at his dacha and do all of, the, all of the electricity on your dacha for you. The problem is, where does he get the money? Uh, for building, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much you make. A, a country house still costs a lot of money, especially if you build it from 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 the ground up. That would mean that there is a certain incentive to find more money for your own personal pleasure in life. And there is a uh, in 2014, we've heard reports of Ukrainian units selling weapons, and it's in the report. Uh, of selling uh, weapons and other ammunitions and everything else to the what we call rebel rebels to the insurgents, will that happen again? There is a really high danger that that will happen. That's it for now. Thank you, Fred, for the very many evocative uh, examples and also the very insightful comments. We have a number of questions in the chat, many of them quite long and detailed. I know that the speakers have had a chance to review them, but I'd like to sort them, if you don't mind, into three sets, and then we can do them one by one. So the first, we have a number of questions on what is it useful to compare the situation we're looking at to? Do you feel that the what we've seen in the Balkans, do you feel that what we saw in the following the collapse of the Soviet Union are useful comparisons to make? And um, how might they help, I guess, policymakers who are planning for the post-conflict and reconstruction phase? If I take that as the first question, can I offer it um, 
who would like to go first? Mark? Sure. I mean, I think that, I mean, for me, I think the, the Balkans does offer a pretty compelling parallel, um, both because of the proximity of the, the very buoyant European market, as well as the capacity to also reach down into Middle East and, and, and African markets. And we saw, I mean, after the, well, not one, but two state collapses in Albania, and also the various conflicts uh, around the fragmentation of Yugoslavia, we saw, again, this pattern of weapons coming in and then being squeezed out again once, once the fighting stopped. And why I think the, the, the Balkans are a particular example worth looking at is because, although frankly, at the time, this was handled pretty badly, because it has been a continued issue, I think over time, a wheel was slowly invented with a whole variety of, of, of different measures, which actually are, are having a real input. And I think this is why I think it's really important that these kind of examples are, are, are looked at properly, because we don't want to actually waste time reinventing stuff which already has painfully and slowly been, been developed. Other conflicts, I mean, one, one could look at what's happened in Afghanistan, one could look at the uh, former Soviet Union. I don't think they work quite as compellingly, not least because of the sort of the context, particularly because the last issue where, where they, why the Balkans uh, are a good example is frankly the amount of Western money that was potentially available to address the issue in a way that other, other conflicts are either too big, too far, or just simply too problematic to, to provide assistance to. So I think that's where I would say that we need to learn lessons and, you know, lessons already have been learned and apply them across. It won't be exact and direct, but nonetheless, it provides a pretty decent template to start with. Thank you. Um, Fred, Anna, do either of you also want to drop in on that question in terms of comparisons to other contexts? Feel free um, to yeah. find out. Yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to add uh, in, in terms of the Soviet example. Uh, I mean, one, one thing to bear in mind why this is, uh, you know, it could be a useful model for uh, to, to look at is that the patterns of uh, corruption in, in Ukraine and Russia, these are shared patterns um, and uh, that could inform uh, the patterns we see in terms of uh, proliferation down the line. Uh, so I think in that in that particular sense, in that one sense, um, given that um, institutional uh, corruption, for instance, in the military uh, in Ukraine and in Russia, these are all Soviet, um, these have Soviet precedent and um, you know they they, they share uh, they share certain patterns which be, would be useful to look at. So I just wanted to add, add add that. Thank you, Anna. Fred, anything to add on to that or no? Fine. Um, so the second set of questions. There are a number of very concrete questions around what can what is being done by whom. Uh, noting in particular foreign, what kinds of interventions by foreign law enforcement and military are already taking place to promote arms control. What role could certain actors play? So somebody mentioned the OSCE and questioning, of course, also the EU, what they have put in place and what they are planning, if you know. Um, apologies for my dog in the background. I, Mark, I know you listed a number of initiatives in your presentation, again, do you want to go first? Um, sure. I mean, very, very briefly. I mean, I noticed that often one, one of the light motifs of the questions was basically, you know, who who is who is any good at this? And I think, in fairness, I would say no one is very good at this at the moment. The Americans are clearly putting a certain amount of resource into it, but that's just simply because the Americans have got more money than, than, than most other other actors to, to to throw at this. But as I say, I think at the moment it's still so much been focused on that that the heavy weapons rather than the, the small arms, which frankly are, are much more of a sort of threat to societies on, on this level. I mean, the European Union is clearly becoming aware of this issue, which is a very encouraging sign. Now, again, I, I don't want to come across, given that I'm speaking from, from, from the UK, like a little Brexiteer, but it has to be said that there is sometimes quite a significant gap between the European Union becoming aware of anything and actually doing anything about it. But nonetheless, I mean, I think that that is definite progress because when it comes down to it, look, organizations like the OSCE, they absolutely ha have a function, but in a way they will have a function in applying and facilitating the processes that national governments and blocks of national governments impose or encourage. 
given that one of the crucial levers that is available to the outside world will precisely be the issue of reconstruction funds and development. That will be a crucial moment in which actually, for the best of all reasons and, and, and in, in the most loving way, but nonetheless, um, coercion can be applied to Kyiv to say, you need to address these various things if you want the copious amounts of money, which we are willing to send your way to rebuild your shattered cities and, and, and redevelop your, your economy. So, I mean, I, I think at the moment, as I said, no one really com comes out with, with, with even a passing grade. European Union is getting there. But I think, again, the, the crucial thing is precisely appreciating that there will be um, a magic moment as the end game nears, before the end of the war, but when people have started seriously talking about reconstruction, that actually pressure can be brought to bear. And hopefully it won't need to be because Kyiv will be alive to the, to the um, situation. But unfortunately, I think like Fidir, at the moment, I can't feel particularly optimistic that Kyiv really has a, a plan or a clue on this. Uh, Fred. I can, I can add, yes, uh, exactly. I think that's a very good point, uh, but I think that that the uh, the sooner it's done, the better. There's already a lot of talk about reconstruction, right? Why not make this issue part of the discussion on reconstruction? Uh, I also think that, you know, since Ukraine is moving towards NATO and NATO standards, I think the military can also play a, a large role in that. All of law enforcement, actually, but the military in particular, because NATO standards, it's not just the weapons you use, but it's also how you store them, how you count them, you know, everything that has to do with them that should be done in a particular and uh, let's call it the right way, okay? Of course, NATO sort of loses weapons also from time to time, but it doesn't lose tanks and airplanes and helicopters, which are found uh, that, are, that some people are trying to smuggle them into Hungary, as we've seen. I mean, you don't just find a helicopter somewhere and you know you take it and try to smuggle it in. So if you have you know uh, sort of rules about how you store weapons, and how there's accountability for, for these storages. And they don't burn down from time, time to time because somebody, uh, you know, smoked a cigarette and then, you know, several tons of munitions disappear. And when they look at it, it seems that only half of it exploded. Where's the rest, you know? So I think these things can be talked about at this point. And I think the military and law enforcement should be a large participant in these talks and these discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. And uh, anything this round or no? Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to add one one thing. I mean, however difficult this is, uh, you know, we, we are seeing that in Kiev, it's difficult to have certain conversations, uh, particularly the ones that need to start happening, especially on uh, DDR, um, demobilization, uh, disarmament and reintegration. And I think one way this this is where uh, Ukraine's partners could should really uh, could really step in, but there's a way to do that because again, it's, it's difficult. You can't just come in and say, you need to do this. Um, I mean, uh, you know, th th there's a course of element there, but that would be difficult to pull off. Uh, but I, you know, in my, in my experience, people at the state department, they're very, they're always eager to help, uh, you know, and uh, this is a matter of, uh, you know, having a very soft conversation um, with, uh, you know, counterparts in Ukraine, uh, about the need to just start this start this uh, th th this conversation and say how can we help you? Not in the sense you need to be doing this right now, but this is a complicated issue. I notice you're not talking about this. What can we do to help? And again, I don't know to what extent much would come of this, but as a starter, just to get this, um, uh, ju just to get this uh, pe people saying these things out loud, which uh, you know, as I as I understand, it's it's a very divisive political issue in in Kiev right now. People are loath to do. I think this is where um, you know, just outside actors raising this issue would help. Thank you, Anna. That is, Sorry, if uh, I can add, uh, oh yeah, I ahead. think uh, as a journalist, of course, I would love those soft touches to be very public. Uh, I think that this needs to become a part of the public discussion, uh, because if it's, you know, done in offices, uh, the whisper might not make it 
down to the public, you know. So if it's an op-ed in the New York Times, it's one thing. If it's said, uh, you know, uh, the, to the president during a private conversation, he might forget. You know, he has a lot of things on his mind and it's okay to forget. But if it's something that's, you know, sort of it's always there, I think, and, and because it's such an important topic, I think it should be there. And it's not just, you know, that we need it. It's it's just that this will happen. And the sooner we talk about it, the sooner there's a small push. You're saying you don't know if it'll work. It will. Uh, but if there's no push, it won't happen because they're they're not thinking about those things uh, up there. They're thinking about other things. They're, uh, you know, they're already victorious. They're part of the EU and NATO. And, you know, those are just small things you need to talk to talk about and think about, you know, arms control, stuff like that. It's not that important. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists all for those responses. Um, a nice one or two questions actually came together next on the role of the occupied territories, both what scenarios do you see? Mark, I know you spoke to some in particular highlighting the risks, but what scenarios do you see for the de demobilization, reintegration, and overall stabilization of the situation in the occupied territories and what role might they possibly play as a conduit in arms trafficking? Um, Anna, maybe you want to go first this time? I know you're quite hot on this topic. Well, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have I have written uh, extensively. Please plug the book now. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is a very complicated issue. It's very difficult because uh, you know, given Russian aggression, it's very hard for Ukraine uh, to talk about the civil element, the divisions, the political divisions in the East. Um, this is completely understandable. This is especially understandable because this is something that the Kremlin has used as part of its propaganda narrative to say that we are just defending, you know, the poor defenseless Russian speakers in uh, Donbass uh, who were persecuted by, by Kiev. Um, this is obvious, these are obviously, you know, propaganda narratives and should not be taken at face value. However, that does not mean that the issues on the ground that the Kremlin has been exploiting uh, and embellishing and lying about should not be addressed. In fact, that means that they should especially be addressed. And I think one of the problems um, in the beginning and in 2014 was uh, precisely the inability of the new government in Kiev to have a dialogue with these Russian-speaking groups with these uh, nascent pro-separate, uh, pro-Russian or separatist groups, and you know, in the sense of, look, guys, you are Ukrainians. We, you know, let's let's have let's talk one-on-one uh, -on -one without the Russians um, about what we want together and how we can build a cohesive um, sovereign society together. As you know, with 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 your interests taken into account, because when that dialogue does not happen, uh, and this is this is a much wider polit political issue that feeds into um, the conflict that provide that creates opportunities um, for Russians to exploit these divisions to their advantage, as they did. Um, now, in the context of what happens next, obviously, we're in a completely different uh, situation right now um, with the war. Um, um, but that is it, it is still going to be an issue. And in fact, we are we are already seeing some of these challenges, uh, challenges in terms of how we deal with um, those who were either forced to collaborate by the Russians in occupied territories or did so out of their own free will, or how, how can you even tell the difference? Um, that is especially going to be a problem in territories that Russia has occupied for nearly a decade. Uh, in uh, the, the, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's, People's Republic in the Southeast. Um, and I think that if you start out by basically uh, alienating these uh, and calling them all collaborationists, you're creating a problem that you are basically making it hard for you, for you to control them. Uh, and controlling them is going to be necessary. To do that, you have to integrate them into society. Again, it's going to be a very difficult conversation to have. Um, you know, but it needs to start happening. Uh, how do you how do you reach out to these people? Which people do you reach out to? Which people do you arrest? Which people do you um, how do you define them? 
Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of weapons prol proliferation, this is going to be particularly important because um, if these uh, groups are alienated, if they are not accounted for, uh, what, are the, what else are they going to do but sell their weapons? And that is, I think, where the real danger is coming from. It's in the East, in the Southeast, and, you know, how we're, how we're going to bring these groups uh, back, into, uh, back into Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Anything to add, gentlemen? I uh, add, add something just very briefly. Is that again? If you think of think of the conflict, and we assume that the, these territories, um, you know, re return to, to Kiev's control. Well, obviously, the, the Russians will redouble uh, or, or treble their border security because precisely, you know, they will be exceedingly aware of the issue, which will actually again drive trade westward. More to the point, the irony is that uh, you know, by all means, if, if Ukraine wishes to join NATO, etc., that, that that that's fine, and that's for, for, for NATO. But we shouldn't pretend that, in fact, a military alliance will instantly bring security to Ukraine. Ironically, Ukraine's long-term security is dependent upon a happy, prosperous, stable Russia that is willing to accept Ukraine's sovereignty and its right to exist. Given that, unfortunately, I think it's fair to say that we can't, don't quite see that on this side of the horizon, what we will probably see is a future in which, regardless of whatever deals are struck, Russia will continue actively to seek to destabilize Ukraine. Um, and it will you know, use every means at its disposal, from supporting divisive political elements to encouraging organized crime, especially when that organized crime is also going to be internationally embarrassing for, for Kyiv. And again, where the Russians have most traction, where they have most agents, and when they have people who are actually willing to, to engage with them, will essentially be in the, in the occupied territories. So again, I think this is why, I mean, there's gonna be this very delicate balance. On the one hand, Kyiv absolutely will have to focus its security efforts on that area. But on the other hand, if it does so in a way that is actually apparently or perceived as heavy handed and prejudicial, it actually will, will play to the Russians' hands and make it even easier for them to do this. So it's gonna be a very, very difficult project ahead. Um, even if frankly, Kyiv was thinking about it now, it would di be difficult. Thanks, Mark. Fred. Mark actually said everything, but uh, Anna mentioned that, you know, uh, some people would be uh, would have an incentive to sell the weapons they would also have i think uh, an incentive to uh again uh sort of revolt if they're treated as second rate citizens if they are labeled traitors collaborators whatever i think they will have an incentive to continue their glorious past so to speak and they will have a symbolic meaning to their fight because uh, this would actually tell them that what they have been doing for a decade was right because they are considered second-rate citizens. So there should be a balance because on the other side, of course, you have the ultra-patriotic Ukrainian community uh, that would say, no, they're traitors, you know, you, you, they, they don't deserve anything, let them all go to Russia, leave, whatever. So yes, this balance has to be struck in some way, but again, it's something that needs to be thought about and analyzed and maybe coming up, coming up with a plan now and not when some territory is liberated because all we're seeing as journalists on the deoccupied territories is finger pointing. So one neighbor saying this neighbor was a collaborator and the other one saying no he was or she was and that's a big problem because if you're a collaborator that means you're the bad guy the bad woman and you should be persecuted which is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next set of nice little questions. Um, we've looked a lot at where arms are now or where they are. We will come from. The a couple of questions about where will they go to? So what should we worry about in terms of what networks exist to move them out? Where are their likely destinations to go? And I thoroughly recognize, of course, in most cases, this is rampant speculation. Who would like to rampantly speculate first? Mark. OK, doesn't look like no one else is throwing themselves on the grenade. Um, so, so I shout. I mean, look, you see, the, the honest answer is, of course, I don't know. 
or rather it'll, it'll go wherever there, there is a market. That's what we've seen time and again. First of all, we will see relatively small scale trades, I imagine, going to underworlds across Europe, because that's the obvious and logical place. There are connections. We know that there are gangsters in Europe who are already looking to Ukraine as a potential source. But as I said, this, this, this will not be sort of um, you know, truckloads of, of Kalashnikovs, I'd, I'd imagine, if nothing else, because that's not where the, where the market is. The issue is then also, okay, where, where does it go beyond that? Um, in, the, in the sense of in, insurgents and terrorists and, and such like. And again, the interesting thing is they don't tend to be market makers. They tend to be market followers. Usually it's actually the gangsters who are the most entrepreneurial and the, the quickest to identify sources. And then after established markets have been made, that's when insurgents and terrorists sort of move into it. That's the pattern we, we, we've seen elsewhere Except, and this is a, you know, a sort of point worth making, where there are existing connections. I mean, there it's quite interesting that we see, for example, there are uh, Kosovans and Chechens fighting on behalf of Kyiv. There are Chechens and Serbians fighting on behalf of Moscow. And certainly we've already had some admittedly very partial patchy and anecdotal evidence to, to suggest, for example, that some of the Kosovan fighters are already talking with families back home about the opportunities that may arise for non-traditional uh, tr transfers of weapons, shall we say, one, once the war is over. Um, so, you know, I think so. it will be basically where the market drives it. It will be where you might say existing kind of networks can connect to fighters who are able to procure weapons and transfer them. And then probably after like a kind of six to 12 month lag, we can expect to see terrorists and see if this is a market that, 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 that they can also access. But as I said, I mean, to a large extent, these are very, very fluid markets, which will depend on, frankly, whether the war ends in six months, 12 months, or 24 months, or longer. Fred, I'm gonna force you to take the floor now, please. Yes, uh, if you wouldn't mind explaining what it is that the GI is doing in order to monitor outward flows, that would be great. Oh, was that Anno for me? Sorry. To you. Oh, sorry, sorry, I missed that. I missed the name. Uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, we're, we're actually preparing a sort of a large report on, on weapons uh, smuggling. And so that would actually sort of give you an idea of what we think, where the weapons will go and where they're going right now, actually. Because we're doing a lot of field work in uh, the countries neighboring Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, also, uh, so you would be probably interested in that. Um, and I think also uh, a turning point uh, would be the reopening of the Odessa port. I think the, the importance of this port in the Black Sea region uh, to neighboring countries uh, and to countries who have been traditionally involved in a lot of illicit activity like the, like the countries on, on you know, Georgia, Armenia, or Turkey, for instance. Uh, and if you try to take the drug flow, uh, Turkey was always an important player in the, in the drug flow business in the Black Sea region. So with the reopening of Odessa, uh, the routes of weapon smuggling and drug smuggling would change again, because right now everyone is bypassing Odessa. They're using in Ukraine the uh, Danube River ports, which are a lot smaller and it's harder to get there. Plus they're using the Bulgarian ports, Varna in particular, and of course, Constanza in Romania, which have become more important for all the illicit flows in the Black Sea region. But Ukraine's importance and Russia has blocked the, the, the Black Sea uh, region for Ukraine. Uh, understanding the importance of uh, Black Sea trade for Ukraine, you know, the, the, the seaways. But, they, but for criminals and for all the, the related groups, this is the important route to take. So if the weapon flows uh, start or start going westward, it doesn't mean that they will always go to the Western border. Uh, you know, Poland, Hungary, uh, Slo Slovakia, Romania, Moldova, although we have been seeing signs, especially in Romania and Moldova of things going on. And uh, 
we've had this this report of 82 instances of uh, weapon smuggling uh, on the border um, with Ukraine. So, but the southern routes are the important routes. And as you know, criminals always use ports. They're a lot easier to get into, a lot easier to take take the, your stuff in and out because of the volumes and because of uh, you can always buy off uh, you know the officials and stuff pay off the officials and stuff like that so i think speculating just speculating i don't know like mark said you know uh, uh but i think the southern route will be very important for the future uh, weapons trade and uh, even before even during the war right now we've been seeing instances in odessa where weapons flows have been noticed so there was an explosion because someone brought a souvenir there was uh, supposedly a stockpile of weapons being brought from the so-called international legion and disappearing uh, somewhere near the romanian border plus we we have a lot of information on a lot of illicit groups very active uh, in that region the bessarabia region which is the region uh, on the border with Moldova. So it's south of Odessa, uh, a very important region for any illicit activity in Ukraine. So speculating, of course. Thanks. Thank you. The GI is hoping to not have to speculate. Um, over the long term, we have recently established a longitudinal study that is taking markers of arms prices on the black market along the series of major routes towards destinations as far afield as North Africa or Latin America using our network observ observatories. So taking regular um, interval points on how much it costs to buy key weapons and ammunition in different places, which we would hope would give an insight into the supply and demand dynamics of different weapons flows and hopefully provide the capacity to identify early warning and likely targets for where these flows are likely to go. So we will be happy, of course, to share more information about the study, and we will be uh, sharing our preliminary findings after a year of analysis in the months to come. Anna, do you have any comments on arms flows, or can I take uh, another round? Uh, oh, just very, very, very quickly. I mean, what I've what I've seen is the first uh, the first route uh, seems to be the, something that's been brought up a lot is Poland, um, kind of the, the 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 obvious route. And there's because mainly there's a uh, there's already a, a certain demand there. Uh, there is there are cross border connections and and, and things like that. Um, but that, that 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 that's about it. I mean, I, I generally agree that that it's going to be. Um, as uh, Fender said, the, the 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 southern route uh, that we're going to see more of this happening down the line. Thank you. We have only a few minutes left, so I'm going to drop a beautiful little set of last questions uh, to the panel. A number of our questions have looked actually at what has been the impact of into criminal economies in neighboring regions. So the Balkans was mentioned, the Black Sea region was mentioned, and there is some question actually around what might happen with demobilization, organized crime, and urban violent crime in Ukraine. So a perfect closing question for those of us at the Global Initiative, what do we see as the impact of this catalytic event on the political economy of crime in other places? Who'd like to go first? Mark, if you got off your last sword, you can fall on this one. You really had it in for me. Okay. Um, I mean, clearly, this is one of these huge topics that, that quite frankly, we, we could spend another hour and a half talking about. And no doubt at some point we will. Very, very briefly, just, just to pick up on a few points. I mean, one, one thing that's worth mentioning, actually, is uh, the northern route of Afghan heroin. Uh, before the war, I mean, this was one of the, this was probably the, the most significant, in my opinion, area of cooperation between Ukrainian and Russian organized crime. There was a lot else that happened, but in, but in some ways, th this represented the, the spinal backbone of, of that interaction. And about a third of all Afghan heroin went through the so-called northern route. So a lot of it went into Russia and stayed in Russia, where, because they have a very serious heroin problem. But a lot of it went towards Europe, because that's where even more money was to be made. Now, clearly, that has, to a considerable extent, been, been choked off. 
we've seen some going in, in, in other directions, some going, for example, through Belarus, some going through the South Caucasus, but actually more than that, we're probably seeing a reorientation back to the old Southern route along Iran, Turkey, Balkans, in, into Europe. So that, that, that's one of the kind of big global flows that, that is shifting. If we're looking specifically, I mean, Balkans, absolutely, we're seeing an uptick in, in heroin and thus therefore often also swaps. So for example, heroin being sort of shipped off to Latin America in return for cocaine and such like. So you know, it, it, it's picking up some of the slack, but I don't think, and others may have different perspectives that it's actually having a major impact there. In terms of the Black Sea, very little I'd really to, to beyond what, what Fidel said. So much of it depends, frankly, on the end of the war, the unblocking of Odessa, and obviously other kind of uh, maritime flows um, around the area. Let me spend a little bit more time talking about the issue of demobilized soldiers. And particularly, I'm thinking back to the end of the Soviet war in Afghanistan, when the Afghansi, the veterans of that war, again, disenfranchised, marginalized, unhappy, scarred, and largely neglected, actually ended up becoming you know, a whole cohort of foot soldiers for an emerging organized crime community there. But that's the whole point. They were more foot soldiers than organizers. And I suspect that to a large extent, what we will see, despite clearly, uh, again, as, as Fidel has mentioned, the sort of brotherhoods that emerge within the military, I think that if, we, if we're going to see sort of military units kind of maintain their cohesion, sure, some may well get involved in the more kind of violent end of organized criminality. In fairness, there is still a certain amount of state capacity in Ukraine to, to deal with that. And quite frankly, I imagine a lot of these, these uh, you know, thuggish ex-fighters will probably find themselves being recruited into the police to deal with their fellow thuggish ex-fighters who are now on, 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 on the wrong side of the law. What I think rather is we need to be aware of, first of all, a large number of individuals who can be recruited by existing organized crime networks, which will then acquire a lot greater capacity, and particularly a capacity towards violence at a time when the state may have its limitations. And secondly, where are the, uh, the real kind of coherent groups of military going to go to? I think they're much more likely to go to the private security industry. We're probably going to see a proliferation of often deeply dodgy, under-regulated private security companies, which will straddle the boundaries between legality and illegality. Because after all, being, and again, Russia provided a perfect example of this in the 1990s, being a, a, a private security guard is often a, a good excuse for a thug to have a gun and a stick and to go out there, whether it's um, collecting debts or, 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 or whatever else. So again, I think these private security companies, which will probably, some of them will be entirely legitimate and legal. Some of them will essentially be organized crime groups at the heart operating behind a front. And others will in some ways be, again, a mix of the two, happy to do legitimate business when there's legitimate business to be done, but also happy to be hired or co-opted by gangs when they need additional muscle. That I think is one of the particular challenges that Ukraine is likely to face. Thank you, Mark. Fred, any comments? Uh, yes, just adding uh, something to what Mark said. I think uh, also, if you talk about private security, we should mention, of course, the Wagner Group, the Russian Wagner Group. And I think uh, the emergence uh, and the usage of these foot soldiers in groups like these, even the Wagner Group, if you take the Russian occupied territories, the tens of thousands of fighters, that uh, who will lose their job basically, you know, uh, when the war is over. I think they will tend to look for ways to stay in the old lifestyle. It's not that you know they, you know, soldiers always say that when they come back to peaceful life, it's there's something wrong with it. They can't do it. You know, there's the, it's it's too quiet, and they want to go back to the brotherhood where where everyone knows each other and they understand each other's problems. And I think Wagner style groups they provide things like that. And I think a paradox will be that maybe some of the Ukrainian fighters will also join uh, Wagner style groups, even Russian sponsored groups, because war is what they do. And, you know, when the war is over, they don't really care as long as they can do what they did before. So I think the, uh, the, the these 
Wagner style groups will have a lot of volunteers to choose from. And I think that's also internationally a big danger because of the different you know, places of conflict that they play a role in. And this role is increasing. And by having more soldiers, they will increase their role again. And that will be a problem for the international community, not just for you know countries around Ukraine or maybe Europe. For instance, Africa is, is, is in real danger, so to speak, because of the Wagner's involvement in a lot of the conflicts there. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Anna, to you. Yes, I just wanted to add two things to that. Uh, one is uh, from, from the past. I mean, this goes back to a lot of the things we were talking about. But for instance, uh, in you know one example, in 2014, when the new Ukrainian government disbanded the Berkut uh, riot, riot police, uh, a lot of these uh, people who had no jobs, nothing to do, they, of course, went and joined the pro-Russian separatist militias. Um, that was like w the first kind of shot in the arm for that movement. That is a danger of, you know, again, what do you do with these people? They need, you know, they, they need to be reintegrated. They, they need to have something to do. And the second issue, uh, kind of even scarier, is uh, Fidger mentioned uh, Wagner, but we have a situation where, uh, you know, Wagner has been recruiting quite actively convicts from prisons. And there are already isolated cases, isolated for now, but I'm sure there's a lot more of this, um, that uh, convicts who went to the front, came back, were released, committed crimes, were imprisoned again. We're going to see a lot of these ex-convicts with war experience scarred by their criminal past, their prison experience, and now their war experience, we're going to see them in society. And I think this is, um, again, this is not so much necessarily an issue of organized crime, although uh, I, I think Mark is right here that uh, potentially these people who are kind of already social outcasts in society, they're going to become foot soldiers for, uh, for organized crime groups. Um, you know, muscle, um, there's going to be a, a, a huge um, supply market in, in terms of jobs in this, in this arena. And that is, that is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be a big problem for Russia, but it, it will also obviously spill out into the region as well. And that's something, I mean, that, 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 that's not even something I'm not, I, I'm not even sure how to begin to tackle that, but it is something that we need to be thinking, we'll start, start thinking about. Thank you. We have reached the end of our time. Um, I would normally give our panelists a chance to say a last word. So since we are basically at the end of time, I will give you the chance to say a last three words, even if they are just goodbye and thank you. Um, and then we will wrap up. I've seen many comments come in both uh, into the group and bilaterally around wanting to make contact with our speakers. You are always, of course, welcome to email the GI and we're happy to pass your questions, comments and contacts on to our panel. So um, as a last round, Anna, your last three words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't count to three, but uh, it was just a really fascinating conversation. I'm really glad we had a chance to uh, talk openly like this. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I hope to do it again sometime. Thank you. These are very necessary conversations, and I'm glad we're having them. Thank you, Anna. Mark? I feel as if I've had so much conversation already. Um, I think, again, I think the, the key thing I would say is, I mean, I'm delighted that we were able to have this virtual conversation um but the point is this this is just the start we need to find ways of articulating this into actually more serious policy discussions uh, and again we, we need to be building on this and that's why i'm delighted to be associated with the global initiative on this thank you mark and thank you very much for the plug and fred to you in kiev the last words well first of all thank you everyone and the three words would be of course read the report because it's very good <laughs> thank you thank Thank you, Fred, and for all the work that you do for us. Um, I will echo his words, read this report, read the other reports from the GI's Ukraine Observatory, and I hope that we will see you either in person or online for future events. Thank you all so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Mark. Genius as always. 
My pleasure, my pleasure. By the way, are you moving into Normandy? Oh, uh, yeah, like, 